Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, a couple people here. One second. My one o'clock class, they were having challenge with my uh, audio. So if, uh, if you're having a challenge, let me know. I was running too many applications, but I cut them all. So I'm, I'm running a minimal, so it should be okay. Okay. Um, okay, so welcome back. Um, week number week number two. All right, I've been based on uh, my uh, one o'clock class and then based on uh, where we're at in general, I will probably move that first exam over to Thursday. Um, we will finish chapter one today and then get into about halfway through chapter two. And then uh, maybe a little bit of three on Thursday and then finish that up on Tuesday. So then I will push that exam up to Thursday to give you a little more time to work on the problems and so forth. Okay, so I'll send an email off to that effect here um, later on today. Okay, any questions? Everybody know where your stuff is at, right? Where your textbook's at, where you can get your quick, oh, a word about quizzes. Canvas uh, calls everything a, qu a quiz. So someone asked me about a question about a quiz, and I'm like, well, what happens is Canvas treats everything as a quiz. Anything you do online, we label it differently. So we got homework quiz to keep in, in line with what Canvas calls it. And even your exams are called a quiz and an exam. So they're, they're, as per Canvas, they're all quizzes, but you have you have an exam and you have homework, all of them online. Okay, nothing different. Uh, other than the name. Okay. Um any questions, comments, concerns? No? Okay. Well, let us continue uh based on where we ended up. Excuse me. We were supposed to submit our name for attendance, correct? Oh no, I won't do I I did I need to do that the first day. Uh, oh, okay. okay, as long as you're here the first day and you guys are doing, I check uh, Canvas and make sure you guys are submitting something at least once a week, you know, and if as per as per the syllabus, if I don't see you do anything, I think uh, seven missing assignments, I haven't seen you in two weeks, and then at that point, I will have to uh, send you an email and say, hey, guys, I got I to gotta drop you. Okay, no, but we're good. Okay. To okay. me, it's it's just like being in person. I mean, this is your money. You pay for it. You know, I, I'm not there, you know, if you're here, fine. If you're not, you know, it's, I'm not forcing you. <laughs> okay. You're all adults here. <laughs> okay. All right. So we ended up here. Is that, is that clear? Everyone understand that, right? Okay. I know some instructors, they do that, you know, the whole semester and they give you you have points for being here and so forth and i you know i'm like you know, i have a different philosophy i mean this is your education you know i can offer you information but it's up to you to ingest it i can't force you to ingest it okay enough on that we ended up here i said get to know the first 20 elements okay get to know their name and their symbol uh, I might as well get to know their number, okay, their atomic number. And then on top of that, uh, we got uh, silver, gold. Uh, silver is AG, gold is AU, lead is PB, and bromine is BR, and I is for iodine, and then HG for mercury. We'll be adding more as we go along. We're not going to end up doing all of the uh, 118 periodic uh, elements on the periodic table, not at all. Um, probably 30, 40, I mean, you know, somewhere in that, on the, along those lines. Okay, so here's your first batch you should be familiar with. Okay, now, the physical states at 25 degrees for approximately room temperature. Did I miss something here? Okay. Uh, get, get to know who are the liquids, who are the solids, and who are the gases. You might think that's 118 things to memorize. Well, not 
really, if you look at that table, uh, there's only 12 gases. Two of them were liquids and the rest were solid. Okay. Mercury and bromine are the liquids. Now, gases, I have a I have a table here. Next one to show you all this. I have a table here that shows you noble gases. Now you may not be familiar with well, what exactly is a noble gas. Well, let me share with you the periodic table it's, that we use. On the far right, you'll notice a couple of things. Uh, this one I got marked up with information. We're going to learn all about this. But if you look carefully, on top of each column, there is a Roman numeral. Uh, there's two sets of Roman numerals, uh, an A and a B, okay? Most everything we talk about, trans and so forth, will pertain to the A elements, okay? And it goes from group 1A, which is in the far left, then the second group is 2A, Roman numeral 2A, then it jumps all the way across to B, where it's boron, and starts again in group 3A, and it goes all the way to the last column, which is 8A, okay? Now, these guys in this last column have a very unique name. They are called the noble gases. They are all gases, okay, at uh, 25 degrees. And something unique, that Roman numeral means something. We're going to give in much detail. It's going to give you a lot of information. But what this means is, when we get into our model of how the atom is put together, I'm going to talk about the electrons being in certain orbit energy levels. Well, like anything, like an onion, you have an outside layer. Okay. There's a set of onion, a set of onions, there's a set of electrons that occupy the outside layer of the atom. And that outside layer, that's where all the actions happen. That's where all the chemistry occurs is on the outside, and that's called the valence shell. That is how many, uh, that is the out, that's where all the action happens, enough of that. The noble gases, all of them, starting from neon down, have on the outside layer, eight electrons. This magical number eight we're gonna learn is, is very crucial. For some reason, uh, well, there is a logic. There is a reason, but beyond the scope of one thirty. But there is a magical eight number where there are eight electrons on the outermost shell, which makes it very stable. Okay, and makes it very unreactive and inert. So the noble gases are considered inert because they won't react. Why? Because their outermost shell is intact with eight. The only exception is He, which is helium, and this magical number is two. The driving force for all chemical reactions for these elements to go from one form to the other is to obtain that eight around it. And they're gonna obtain that by either gaining electrons or losing electrons, okay? Because by doing that, it's gonna fill the outermost gaining electrons, it will fill the outermost layer because some of them don't have a full eight. And I can tell you already, for example, everybody in group 6A, they have six valence electrons. Everybody in group 7A, guess what they have? Seven valence electrons. And if you had to take a wild guess, how many valence electrons do you think everybody in group five has? V5, VA. Five. And those guys, because five is not eight, they need three more to pick up to get that magical eight. So they would have a tendency to pick up three electrons. Whereas the other guys have a tendency to lose electrons because in doing lose, losing electrons, now the next layer in is full and, we, and they got the magical eight. Okay. So the noble gases is that last column. And, and they're very inert. So those are gases, and there's there's uh, 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 seven of them. And then on top of that, you have H2, N2, O2, F2, and Cl, which are hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Okay. And so we have what um, five more. So we got a total of twelve elements that are gases, two of them are liquids, and then subtract from the 118, 
Okay. You have a total of 14, so you had the rest as 104. It turns out my mouse, my pen, and Zoom, the new Zoom, they got updated. They're not like each other. So I'm trying to get that. My pen works great for other applications, but for Zoom, it does crazy stuff. It won't function well. So there's 104 solids, 12 liquids, excuse me, 12 gases, and two uh, liquids. Notice the subscript on these gases, like hydrogen. That means that there are two atoms of hydrogen bonded together, and we shorthand write it with two because we're going to learn for hydrogen, for example, I'm going to put a line between two H's, and that represents a bond between those two atoms. Normally, these guys, mo normally these elements by themselves are fine. They're monatomic, no problem. Sodium goes around all by itself, the sodium elements. But some elements are not that stable. And what they need is to attach themselves to another one of themselves to be stable. We call that diatomic. And there's seven of them. We're going to learn about those here in a bit. Okay, there's only seven of these elements that are diatomic. All right, so we got, and again, at 25 degrees and at one atmosphere pressure, these are the physical state. Obviously, we have to, we have to say what temperature because at negative 30 degrees Celsius, obviously we get a different physical state, right? So this, um, Periodic table shows you what I just talked about. The ones in yellow are the gas. Okay. The two pink ones, which is a mercury and, and a bromine, sitting right here. Those are the liquids, and then everybody else is in blue. Okay. These letters S, D, F, and D, P, we're going to come back to them and uh, they have they stand for a specific something that we're going to learn about and the takeaway here is there's two columns in the s there are six columns in the p section six columns if you start from here one two three four five and six there's two for the s there are 10 for the d group and there are 10 columns and then there are 14 for the f Ah, come on again, 14, okay? And it's really amazing that the periodic table came out like this because you'll see here, those numbers I just printed out have to do with the electrons that we're gonna learn about, okay? I'm just giving you a heads up here. Okay, here's the diatomic elements. There's only seven of them, okay? Here's a little something to help you remember what they are. So have no fear of ice cold. It could be beer, it could be beverage, or whatever you want B to stand for. Okay. Uh, so we got H stands for hydrogen. N stand and no stands for nitrogen. F and fear stands for fluorine. O and O stands for oxygen. I in uh, ice stands for iodine. C does not stand for carbon. I tell you right now but it stands for chlorine, chlorine. And then the B stands for bromine. So these folks are the own of the 118 elements are diatomic and by themselves, they, they cannot be monatomic under standard conditions, okay? All right, most of, you can see that most of them are gas except for bromine. Now, all these elements, we have only three types to work to work to worry about. We have what are called metals, and then we have what we call nonmetals, and then we have something that are called semi-metals. You may also hear the term um, metalloid. Metalloids are also used to describe the semi-metals. Now, what is a semi-metal? Think of it as a mule. And I said, what does a mule got to do with chemistry? Well, what do we know about mules? Anybody know what a mule, how, 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 where a mule comes from? 
Please don't tell me the mule factory, okay? <laughs> How do you make a mule? Anybody know? No? Okay. A mule is a combination of a horse and a donkey. Okay. And so a mule has characteristics of a donkey and characteristics of a horse. And that's what a semi metal is. It is a metal, it has characteristics of a metal and characteristics of a non metal. Okay. Now, the big takeaway from this, and put this in long term memory. Okay. All metals, all metals want to lose electrons. Okay. All metals want to lose electrons. Ah, come on, Pen. I'll let you write that electrons. And guess what? All nonmetals, what do you think? If metals want to lose electrons, what can you surmise that nonmetals want to do? Gain. Yeah. All right. Now, something else to think about here, because electrons are negativity. Electrons are negative. Now, think of it in terms of psychological terms. You got a person, no person who's got a lot of negative attitude, right? If they lose that negativity, do, do they become more negative or more positive? From a psychological standpoint. More positive, right? A person becomes more positive. So with the, the element that loses electrons, guess what? They become positive in nature. And the converse of that is if something, if a person be, picks up negativity, don't they become more negative, right? And that's true with elements. The nonmetals that pick up electrons become negative in, in character, more negative in character, okay? And they do that for a reason, because you will find that the nonmetals are way over here, Roman numeral five and above. The guys in Roman numeral 5A, they're only three metal, three electrons away from getting that magical eight. So they gain three electrons and become negative in charge, in overall charge. Now, where are exactly are the stair steps? Now, do we have to memorize where they're at? No. Okay, because the periodic table has a stair step. Okay. If you look at this stair step, starting with uh, boron number five, okay, you see right here, there's a little stair step right here, okay? The chemicals on, the elements on this stair step are the semi-metals. And to the left of the stair step are the metals. The only exception is way over here, H is hydrogen, that's a gas. It's a non-metal, okay? So that, it's put over here for a particular reason, but remember it is a, a non-metal. Everybody to the right of this stair step are the non-metals, are the non-metals. Now remember I said earlier about the number of valence electrons. So everybody number group 6A, they got six valence electrons. They're dying to get two electrons to get that magic weight, you know, and Getting gaining two electrons versus versus getting rid of six is more energy effective to gain two and to lose six. It's all about energy. Mother Nature is going to take the easy way around. So anyway, uh, and so these guys will end up with a negative charge, whereas the to get that happy eight around its valence shell, whereas metals tend to want to. Give them up, give up the electrons. All right, so let me um, go back. And here we have it here. The ones in green, you can start here with boron and kind of go a diagonal and straight down, diagonal across, down, across, down, and then across. Numbers 117, really, I don't know for sure at this point whether this can be a metalloid, but it's probably predicted that it's probably going to be a metalloid. So, so everybody in red, light red, are the nonmetals, including hydrogen, and then all of the blue are in metals.
Okay, so all the blues want to lose electrons, all the ones in red want to gain electrons. Okay. All right. Now, some of the properties of metals, well, in general, a lot of the metals are shiny in appearance. Uh, you can take metals and you can flatten them and, and, and actually stretch them out through, a, through what we call a die. For example, in my research days, I did a lot of work with respect to copper metal, which is ironic growing up in Superior, which is a copper mining facility. But I did a lot of research on copper and we used a lot of quarter inch thick copper and seven millimeter inch copper. And that begins with a chunk of copper, which is about maybe three or four feet thick, you know, feet thick. And it gets processed through a rollers, which humongous building, and they go from that length thickness down to a quarter inch. So that's one of the properties of metal. A lot of the copper wires are created the same way. Anyway, all metals are solids except, as you know, mercury. Mercury is a is a liquid. It used to be used a lot on uh, uh, circuits, uh, not circuits, but for um, um, thermostats, where the digital world came into play. Generally, their density tends to be high. Okay, and they're very. They have a very high melting point. It takes a lot of energy to get them to to melt. Okay. Metals are very good conductors of electricity simply because the magnitude of electrons on the surface and being good conductors of electricity, they're uh, also good conductors of heat. That's a general rule of thumb. Conduct electricity well, good, good conductors of heat. Okay. Nonmetals, when they're metallic, the ones that are solids are dull in appearance. Okay. If they if they're solid, they tend to be non uh, brittle, and and a lot of them are gases. Okay, and their density relative to the metals are relatively low, and they tend to melt in fairly uh, low temperature. Okay, and being non conductors, a lot of the non metals are non conductors. They're very they're very low. They're more insulators as far as uh, conductors of heat are concerned. Now, based on what I've given you so far, looking at the product table, be able to determine the name of at least those 20 plus what the others we gave you, okay? Uh, be able to look at any of the 118 elements be given that and then determine based on the product table and its position, determine whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, okay? It is not necessary to memorize all 118 properties. You just look at the periodic table and tell you, okay, element number, I don't know, 20 is a solid. Okay. And plus, it's a metal. So be able to determine not only what its physical property is, but determine whether it's a metal, a non metal, or semi metal. I can tell you right now, we're not going to work a lot with semi metals. Our, our focus is going to be basically metal and nominals. Now, why is it important to know whether an element is a metal or a nominal? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you why, okay? Because it's going to tell us, by looking at the formula, what type of chemical compound you're working with. Of all the chemicals out there, there's only two types. There's a type where you have a combination of a metal and a non-metal. I'm going to designate that as M and and M, okay? An example of that would be something you put on your French fries. Sodium chloride, table salt. Isn't sodium a metal? Yes, it is, okay? And chloride, isn't that a non-metal? Yes, it is. Here's, here's chloride and sodium's right there, okay? And that combination makes it into a specific type of compound. Specifically, we're going to learn about this called ionic compound. The other combination is a combination of a non-metal and a non-metal to make a compound. Remember, you got to have two different elements at the minimum to make a compound. Well, a good, a good example would be, let's say, water, everyday water, H2O. 
See, isn't hydrogen a non-metal? Yes, it is. It's over here. Isn't oxygen a non-metal? Yes, it is. Okay. And so that combination produces a another type, the second type of compounds that we're going to work with, which also tells us what type of bonding or interaction occurs. The sodium chloride bonding, and I use that word loosely, bonding is more like two magnets coming together because the sodium we're going to learn is going to have a full positive charge and the chloride is going to have a full negative charge and they're going to come together and that's how they're going to attract each other. Whereas the water, H2O, they're going to be more like sharing electrons to make a bond that, that is shared. There's no sharing occurring in sodium chloride. And so we need to determine what type of compound it is because then that tells us more information down the road. So be able to remember to determine whether it's a metal, non-metal, okay? And down the road from there, you'll be able to determine what type of compound it is and what type of bonding we're working with, okay? Then, of course, uh, the diatomic, there's only seven. And you might ask, well, why, why do I need to know that? Well, <laughs> uh, let's say, for example, you got H2, it's diatomic, right? You know it's diatomic. Or better yet, the example I showed earlier, we had sodium and chlorine. Remember that? We had sodium and chlorine come together to make table salt, okay? Well, that could be presented in words. It could be presented like a sodium metal in the presence of chlorine gas reacted to produce sodium chloride, okay? And that's in the words. So taking, taking the words, you have to extrapolate and take that and put it into a chemical equation. And you have to write it properly. And you have to know that if you're working with chlorine, it's diatomic, so this would be the correct formula. You know, if I would have said hydrogen gas, then that would be the correct formula if that was a, one of the reactants. Okay. So knowing which ones are diatomic will be important. Okay. Guess what? Congratulations. You made it through one chapter of chemistry. <laughs> We're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. We're going to, you know, we got into, we kind of introduced you to chemistry. And now we're going to start talking about mathematics and numbers. Uh, we kind of started, used to do that first. And, you know, it kind of turned people off in chemistry. We figure we're throwing the chemicals first and then we'll come and get you in the math. It's math is there. We're going to do math. Okay. But I did tell you that we're not using complicated math. We're not going to do differential equations. You, if you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and maybe do some minimal algebra, you're good to go. All right? Nothing fancy. All right. So any questions about chapter one? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about math skills. Well, there is practice problems. Yes, somebody had a question. We have one question. The chapter one activity, even though we just finished the lecture today, it was due tomorrow, correct? The, the one, the chapter one activity, yeah. It should, uh, if it says due today, then I got to correct it. Remember, uh, I won't let anything do, nothing will be due until we get done with it. Okay, I'm going to give you a day or so after we're done with whatever we do before anything's due. Does that get make sense? Done through, yeah, yeah. Get the, get done yeah. Through chapter one, correct? yeah, so we're going to complete the chapter here and then uh, I'll move the dates to one or two days after we complete whatever chapter. So for if every? I, if it's, yeah, for any chapter down the road. So if um, I if it's a chapter one and due to date, then it's my bad. I didn't get to move it because we're not done with chapter. Uh, we just got done with chapter one today. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So and for, and, and for all the chapter one assignments, that do they get extended or yeah. just for the quiz? Oh, uh, okay. Everything, anything for any anything for that chapter will be extended. Okay. We don't uh, I will I don't expect you to. Uh, do the assignment without me finishing up the chapter first. Oh, okay. But in in the homework, you have two attempts. So like I stated earlier, 
you have some people go ahead and do that anyway for the first attempt and then wait until we're done with that chapter and do the second attempt, maybe to, to improve the grade. Thank you. Okay, no problems. Uh, is molecule this is the same as an element? It can be a molecule. The question Thomas has the question is molecule the same as an element? The term molecule is is what is used to express a diatomic element. Okay, and so we can't call uh, a diatomic element a compound because a compound by definition is made up of two or more different elements. Does that make sense? So a molecule, when you use the term molecule, you're generally talking about an element, a diatomic element. Okay? But you will see it occasionally used by people who would say, well, a molecule of water, when we're talking about one, one uh, can also be used to describe a compound. Hi, Professor. Is element one eighteen new? Is element one eighteen OG new? We're talking about number one eighteen. Yes. Uh, the ones that have these letters, like the U letters, this hasn't been updated. They have been given names, but elements uh, 114, 115, and I want to say 117 were found out like two years ago, and 116 and 118 are about the same time. So 113 is a new one too, but they all have their names now. Yeah. Number 11 does not have it listed. Element number 11 is up on top up here, that's sodium. Oh, can you hear me, Professor? Yes. Okay, um, I was just referencing the worksheet for matter. Um, number 11, it says list the noble gases, and I listed them, I also put OG, and then I figured out there was an answer key on the back of the sheet, okay. and it just didn't have um, the 118 down as a noble gas. Oh, okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Uh, it should be listed. If not, then we uh, shoot me. Uh, uh, you listed 118. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So yeah, the answer yeah. to number 11. I got you. Yeah. It's just not reflective on the worksheet. Okay. Did it? Did it? Uh, it, oh, just a worksheet. You so it wasn't something you did on Canvas and got no credit for it. No, no. Okay, I understood. All right, let me make note of that. That should be corrected. Okay, so uh, number eighteen, not on number eleven. Understood. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, the. It should be because 118 is in group number eight, and it is a noble gas. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, all right. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. So, all right. Any other questions? Yeah, feel free to jump in here. Yeah, so practice problems. So we're going to talk about numbers. Okay, we're going to talk about measurements. We're going to talk about what is significant and what is not significant with respect to the numbers. Now, the, the, the important thing here when we talk about significant digits, we're not, we're not saying that that number doesn't matter. That number, it is that number, whatever that number is, it, is, it does matter as far as magnitude and value. What we're saying here is we have to determine how many significant figures numbers have. Because if we need to do a mathematical function, like multiply, divide, add, or subtract, we have to keep this in your head, that our answer should not be more accurate than the least accurate number that you have. Okay, does that make sense? Think about this. Okay, that 
you know, you've seen before on your calculator, you're typing a number and boom, you got like 20 digits, right? You might be tempted to present that 20 digits as an answer, but that would be incorrect. Why? Because your measurement tools were not, are, not as, are not accurate. So you might be measuring like, you know, ballpark measuring distance and say, okay, that's about 20 feet and that's about 10 feet. And then maybe I measure, I, I do my, my area. And then you're limited to your guessing about the distance numbers. But, and so that's gonna be real rough in your, in your final number. But if I got a laser beam and I'm measuring distances accurately, now my answer can be very much more accurate because my tool that I use shows more accuracy, okay? So the main part of all of this is, that, is to present your data no more accurate than the least accurate number that you use to do to get that number, okay? So we're gonna be using metric units, obviously, but we're also gonna deal with some English units because we're gonna talk about converting from one unit to the other because we're gonna have a technique that we're gonna to utilize to help us to convert one unit to the other. And the, the, the nice thing about this technique is you keep track of your units. If your units cancel out properly, then you know you got it set up properly. And, now, and I'll give some examples. The other aspect is this, presenting a number as a number doesn't mean anything. For example, the statement here, a book weighs eight, right? that doesn't, mean anything, okay? It's like telling if you're working out there and your boss says, well, you're getting paid, you know, 50. You might wanna say, okay, 50 what? Dollars, cents, pennies, you know? So units are very important. So that's what's wrong with the comment, there's no units. So whatever you do, you always gotta have units involved with your numbers so that those numbers mean something. Now, all measurements have a degree of uncertainty. There is no measuring tool out there that is 100% accurate. Even if you got a laser beam and you're measuring the distance from here to the moon, there's, in making that instrument, there's a degree of uncertainty in itself. And that measurement has a degree of uncertainty. So nothing's ever 100%, okay? So what we do is we have a tool, we measure something, generally that last number, either being in the 10th place or the 100th place, we're guessing on that last number, okay? Because given the tool that we have to measure, is gonna define how accurate that number is, okay? Now, with respect to length, I'm gonna have a, a, a not, not today, but I'll have a file there. I'm gonna talk about the metric system here in more detail. But for right now, the units that we utilize, which is ironic, here in the US, since I was a little guy in elementary school, we've been trying to convert to the metric units. They're still working in it, I guess. I don't haven't done it. Because you 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 know you go to you go to the grocery store and you buy a gallon of milk. But if you want soda pop, guess what? You buy a two liter bottle. You know, we were like, okay, <laughs> gallons and liters it makes it we gotta work both units. Now with respect to units, we use cm, m, which is centimeters, mm, little, lowercase, millimeters, and uh, little m, lowercase is meters. So we got centimeters, millimeters, meters, and kilometers or kilometers, each tomatoes, tomatoes, whatever you want to call it. All right, so now, when you have tools to measure, you know, the accuracy can determine the number. Now, Look at, look at these two rulers. Which one do you think is a lot more accurate in measuring anything? The white one or the brown one here? What would you say? Which one has more accuracy to measure something? Okay. Yeah, the brown one, simply because it has more increments. Look at the, 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 the white one. We got to guesstimate that last digit. We just, we're, we're just guessing what that last digit is. Now, how accurate do you think we can measure the white ruler with? 
how many decimal places can we, if we're using the white ruler, how many decimal places do you anticipate you can measure to? One decimal place, two decimal place, three decimal place? What do you think? What's your best, what's your best guess? Your best educated guess. Maybe, I, maybe I'll put a mark there. Let's say we got to measure uh, this mark right here. That line, that red line, okay? Maybe I, maybe you can answer it this way. All right, using a white ruler, what would you call that? It's measurement. Yeah, going from, from zero to that red mark. See what I'm saying? Going from, from zero to that red mark. Where would you measure that, that white one? What's your, what's your best guess? Anybody want to take a guess at that? Your best educated guess. We know it's four. For both cases, it's four. Okay. Okay. For the white one, I got 4.4. .4. All right. That's that's acceptable. You all see that? That's acceptable. Got the uh, 4.4. .4. Ooh. All right. I'm going to behave here. 4.4, all right. Some people may even say 4.3. Okay, that's fine. That last number is questionable. That's, that's, a, that's our uncertainty. Definitely wouldn't say five, right? Because five is right between the two. What about, what? Are, so we are only accurate to the 10th place using the white, white ruler. You see that? What about the brown one? Well, we know they're four, right? And maybe what three? Because it's past the three mark. So what about the last point? What would you say? Maybe four point three five. Okay, that's reasonable. You might say six. Maybe the way you twist your head. That's fine. But it it's that is the uncertainty. The last number. But the point is here, that brown ruler, we can go to the 100 place, right? I can go two decimal places compared to the white ruler. So the white ruler is less accurate than the brown ruler. Okay. All right. And so if I were measuring, you know, I got 4.3 and 4.35. Then, if I were to multiply these two numbers or divide them, and just for multiplying, divide these two numbers, my answer should have had no more digits, no more accuracy than the least accurate number. Okay? The least accurate number. All right. So let us... Uh oh I'm having a little bit of a challenge here today. <laughs> All right, so the the one with the most uncertainty would be the white one. Okay, simply because the marks. All right, it's mass. Mass normally we use the symbols mg for milligrams or kg or g for grams. Okay, kilograms. Uh, we got two balances here. You look at the balance on the right. That's a digital balance. If we were doing a lab, in fact. That's the kind the type of balances we would do yeah, if we were you know face to face and actually doing some experiments. But you can notice that number there, 18.7954. You can go to four decimal plates. It's extremely accurate with respect to that balance. And then if you look at the balance on, on the left, that's called a triple beam balance. So you've got to put uh, counterweights and you're kind of just playing with the weights there. You can probably get maybe a hundredth of a of a of a gram of weighing grams here. So obviously the one on the right is a lot more accurate. Okay. A lot more accurate. I did mention the difference between mass and weight before. Okay. Weight is simply from the equation is, is equal to the mass times the gravity constant. We're here on Earth, the gravity constant, I believe, is one uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. And obviously, if we're on another planet, 
we will have a different gravity constant, so therefore your weight will be different. The mass will be constant, but your weight will be different because of the gravitational forces. So here on Earth, you weigh 170. On the moon, you'll be about 29 pounds, okay? However, the mass is constant. Since we're stuck here on the Earth, we tend to interchange both the mass and weight. We tend to use this, the same. So when, that, when we talk about mass, you know, we're here on Earth, we're talking about the weight and vice versa. But keep in mind, it's different. Now, with respect to volume, the units is the capital L, which is liters. We also have kiloliters. We have little m, which is milliliters, okay? And there's some equipment there that helps you measure, uh, measure uh, liquids, the volume of liquids. Now, note, you do have lab experiments where you're taking measurements, okay? Notice something about these measurement tools, like this one here. The zero mark here is in the bottom, okay? If this is called the barrette, the zero mark is on top and you read from down. So depending on the equipment, make sure you know which your, where your zero mark is so you can make sure you read the correct volume, especially in the assignments that you do in the lab, okay? All right, well, some of you who work in a hospital are maybe familiar with it. You've got units here, we're talking about CCs. That's nothing more than cubic centimeter, okay, CC. Now, we have one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter, okay? Now, this is a conversion factor. One ml is equal to one cubic centimeter. And uh, the case with any, yes, uh, the case with any conversion factor, it can be written as a ratio. And so we can write one ml over one cc or, or we can write one cc over one ml. Which one we use depends on what we're multiplying that factor. If we're multiplying the one on the right by let's say 10 milliliters, okay, because we wanna convert milliliters to cc's, we will use the one on the right. Why? Because I know by multiplying this by this, guess what, the milliliters cancel. There's my basic algebra to refresh the memory. If I'm want to, if I have cc's and I want to convert to milliliters, maybe I got ten cc's here. I use the one on the right because I want my cc's to cancel, leaving me with units of milliliters. This is the method we're talking about using convert uh, using the ratio to write them either one either one way or the other. Okay. Um, and we keep track of the units when we start doing calculations down the road. With chemical calculations, I guarantee you we're going to have at the minimum at least three factors. And by keeping track of our units as we go along, we're going to end up with the correct factors. We follow the units. We follow the units. I don't have, we'll have more to say about this in a second. Now, the English units, I got this this to kind of help you out because I had, I've always had a challenge. Well, how many pints in the port and how many ports in the pint, blah, blah, blah. Well, this little picture gives me a, a visual. So if you look at this picture, I got the big G here, which is the gallon, one gallon. And inside the big G, we got four Qs. So one gallon is equal to four quarts, okay? Now, if you look inside the Q, you got two Ps. So that means that one quart is equal to two pints, three Ts. And look carefully inside the P, there's two little Cs. That represents cups. So in one pint, there's equal to two cups. Okay, that kind of help you out. Ah, come in, okay. Each one of these is a conversion factor, okay? That we can set up singly, or we can set up as a unit, or we can combine them to make one. So for example, the one gallon per four quarts. I can write it like this, or I can invert it. Four quarts, uh, the one gallon. 
Now, I know some of you might be tempted to take that four and take the quarter and make it 0.25. My recommendation is this, these numbers, leave them like that. Because I've seen it where you took the, took the one fourth and made it 0.25, but then forgot where the gallon and the quart went. So my recommendation is, and you're gonna have a lot of these factors, keep the factors whole. Put them either a numerator or denominator, no matter the, the number. Now, which one we use depends on the question. If I'm looking for ga gallons and I got quarts, I've got 10 quarts, and I want to convert that to gallons, obviously I'm going to use the one on the right. Why? Look at that. My units cancel. For quarts, I end up with gallons. And if I have 10 gallons and I'm, I want to convert to quarts, I use the one on the bottom. Why? Because my gallons cancel. See how, that, how we're working? Keeping track of your units. Okay, and I can I can combine all these three here as three separate conversion factors, or I could combine them all as one, which, which whichever works for you. Uh, slide ten is missing. Slide ten, you're missing this one, Stephanie. No, yes, um, I. I didn't see that one in the slides. I was looking for that one, and it's not there. I, oh, really? Mm -hmm. We're on where? On. Uh... Yep, I was looking on the the end, like where all the modules are, and I was looking at the powerpoints on the bottom, and that's the only slide that's missing, and and it's a really good visual. So I was trying to see. If oh, you could okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I can do that. Sure. I'm, I'm surprised it's not there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Let me create this up. And... Okay. San G. Make a note of that. Okay. All right, now with respect to reading, uh, this is like in your labs, for example, when you're going to read values. Well, point number one, remember, look at the container you're using, find out where your zero point is. In this case, this is called a graduated cylinder and uh, used to measure, obviously, volume. Okay, now the thing about the most, most liquids is, uh, first of all, look at this is the zero point down at the bottom, and you read it from the bottom up. Is most liquids liquids form this concave shape? They call that a meniscus. Okay. And you generally in the lab, you're looking over here in this direction. You are looking and you read at the bottom of the meniscus, the bottom meniscus, and you read your scale. Okay, to take the, to take your reading and be aware of which direction you're going. Okay. So and uh, there's a few liquids where you have it flipped the other way. So in here, you got uh, 21.5. Was that a reasonable measurement? Yeah, 21.5 with respect to what it what that measures. You know, some people may see 25.6, okay, or 25.4. Again, that last number is the, the uncertainty aspect of it. And then even at that, unless you calibrated that glassware, even at that, your that number that you see is is best guess. Okay. And even calibration has a degree of uncertainty. Now you might think you got to calibrate 100%, but even that, the calibration in itself is a measure. All right. So let's talk about significant digits and figures. What we're talking about here is to determine how many what we call significant digits are there in a number. And why do we want to do that? So that when we do some mathematical function using these numbers, that we don't present more digits than the least accurate digit that we began with, okay? So we got to define or determine what is significant and what is not. Now, there are some rules about this, and I'm going to go through the rules, and then I'm going to break it down and make it simple. I'm going to ask you two questions you can ask yourself, 
when it comes to zero, for example, and you should have no problem determining, yes, it's significant, no, it's not significant. But again, I emphasize, it is significant with respect to value. It's not significant with respect to accuracy of your final data. All right, so going back to the example here, obviously your facial memory, the top one ruler is gonna be up to a tenth, a tenth of a inch to measure in the centimeters, no units, units are missing here, but a tenth place, whereas the bottom one, you can go to the hundred place. So always be aware of the type, the accuracy of your measurement tool. Okay, now let's look at digits themselves. First of all, all numbers one through nine are considered significant and would count with respect to uh, how many sig figs you have. So you can use that information to determine how many sig figs your answer should have. So this number, 4,895.2, has five sig figs because they're all integers, okay? No question there, always integers, always significant. Where the confusion comes into play is zero. Okay, so I'm going to follow the rules first and then I'm going to come back and tell you how you can simplify them. The leading zeros are not considered significant. So the, the 0, 0.000 is not considered significant and would not be a factor in determining how many sig figs. The 5454 are, as per rule one, integers. So yes, they're uh, they are significant. So that number has four sig figs, okay? When a zero is between two integers, it's considered significant. So the number 3050 has three sig figs. The, the trailing zero in this case is not significant, okay? The number 0, 0.00, well, those three zeros up front are per rule number two. And then 2001, those zeros between the two and the one has are per rule number three. So it has four sig figs. So 3050 has three sig figs, and then 0. 0.002001 has four sig figs. Now, if you needed to do a multiplication or division between these two numbers, okay, multiply and divide only for these two numbers, your answer should not have more than three sig figs. Why? Because that number is the least accurate. Okay? You follow? You can't present more accurate numbers than you have to begin with. Let's clear it. Clear the lines. All right. Now, trailing zeros. And if there's a decimal point anywhere in the number, trailing zeros are considered significant if they are in front of, if there is an integer in front of them and there's a decimal point. So look at this number right here. The first two zeros are leading zeros, as per rule number two, are. And that's significant. The integers are, and the question would be the second, the last zero. Well, you ask yourself the question, is for the last zero, is there an integer in front of the last zero? And yes, there is, there's a main. And then the second question is, is there a decimal point anywhere in that number? And the answer is yes. So yes and yes answers makes that zero significance, so this number has three sig figs, okay? Do the same thing with the zeros up front for this number. Is there an integer in front of these three zeros? Answer is no, see, not significant, see? If that, if the, if the question is there an integer in front of them, and if there's a decimal point anywhere in that number, if you answer no to any of those two questions, that zero is not significant. If you answer yes to those two questions, then that zero you're looking at is significant, okay? That hopefully simplifies. For example, this one right here, 28,500. 
Okay, we know that the two negative five are significant because all non-zeros are significant. Question is the zeros following it. Okay, so you ask the question: Is there an integer in front of those two zeros? Yes. Okay. Second question: Is there a decimal point anywhere in that number? Answer is no. Therefore, those zeros are not significant. So that number only has three significant figures. Okay. All right. Got a question here. There's only three, three. The question is in the number 3050, the last zero is not significant. Okay. Because it there's the rule, the rule is this if there's a decimal point anywhere in that number. And there's an integer in front of those zeros, that means that zero is significant. Okay. In this scenario, there's no decimal point at all, just like this zeros here. Yes, there's integers in front, but there's no decimal point. So, with respect to significant figures, this number only has three sig figs. And also, this number here, 28,500, only has three sig figs. Okay. All right. Let's. Okay. Now, the moment you take a number and add zeros with a decimal point, they become significant. For example, you may be at you. You may have a question like this, 50 versus 50.00, okay? All right. Now, the question may be, are those two numbers different? Okay. And what could you say with respect to 50 and 50.00? Were those, are those two numbers different? Let me let me put it this way. Exactly, it's no. Another way to look at it is let's put a dollar symbol in front there. Okay, fifty dollars on top, fifty dollars on the bottom is still fifty dollars. So from the magnitude value wise, they're the same number, but they are different. Okay. And how are they different? Well, for one, 50 only has one sig fig, okay? Whereas 50.00 has four sig figs. So with respect to accuracy, the 50.00 is a lot more accurate than the 50. The true value of 50 can be anywhere from 49, 50 to 51. Okay, here's the number we're working with, but because we don't know what's going on over here, that true value, whatever that true value is, can vary a big range. But look, if you do the same thing for this one, this true value for 50.00 could be 49.99. To 50.00 to 50.01. Look at the range. Okay. You can see that with more decimal places, that range is much narrower than compared to the 50. So, yes, they're both the same number. The difference is the 50 only has one significant figure and is less accurate than the 50.00. Okay. Now, there are what are called exact numbers. These numbers are just by definition exact and therefore do not play a factor in determining how many safe figs you have. So if you have 14 people, it's 14 people. That's an exact number. 
All right, not 14.5 or 0.3, your exact number. Some, some conversion factors are exact numbers, like three feet per yard. There's exactly three foot, three foot in the yard. There's 100 pennies in a dollar, not 101, not 99, but exactly 100. Or a measurement, there's five iPads or whatever you're counting. Those are exact numbers or tall pack. Okay, those are exact numbers. And therefore, they're not measured, they're a quantity, and therefore would not play a factor in determining the number of um, digits you have with respect to your answer. Okay. And we're going to do some examples here, may it come clear in a second. Things that are not accurate, for example, measurements. Anything you measure has a degree of inaccuracy. Seven inches, 200 pounds, 10 ounces, those are all measurements. And therefore, having all measurements, being a measurement, makes it inaccurate and has a degree of inaccuracy. And therefore, can be a factor in determining, will be a factor in determining how many sick pigs your answer would have. Okay, so anything measured is not exact. All right. So let's take a look at this one here. 5.05. How many thick figs do we, does 5.05 have? Three. Exactly. Okay, three. Now, if you're not sure about the zero, ask yourself the question. Look at that zero. First of all, question number one, is there an integer in front of the zero? Yeah, there's a five. Question number two, is there a decimal point in the in that number? Yes, there's a decimal point. Therefore, yes, it's significant. So therefore, you've got, you got uh, three sig figs, okay? Or you can rely back on the rule that says cap these zeros and between numbers, they are significant and you got three. Okay, what about 1,200? Two. Exactly. We got two. Ask the same questions with the zero, but for the two zeros after the two, is there a decimal point? Is there is there a integer in front of the two zero? Yes. Is there a decimal point anywhere in the number? No. Therefore, those zeros don't count. Okay. They with respect to being significant, they count with respect to magnitude because that's twelve hundred. Because if you take them out, then you got the number 12, which we're going to talk a lot about. Okay, you can't you can't just pull them out and say, well, they're not significant, they don't count. Well, yeah, because you're dealing with 1,200. The, the magnitude is 1,200, not 12. All right, uh, the next one we have four, right? The first two are leading zeros, they don't count, but if you forgot that rule, there's no integer in front of the first two zeros, so therefore they don't count. Okay, and the other zeros between the two and the one after the two, well, there's integer in front of both of them, and there's a decimal point in that number. So yes, they count for their four, there's four. How about this one? Any idea how about this one? The next one, 0 0.0005, how many sig figs? One. You got it, one, okay. Again, those other zeros are leading zeros, okay? And then finally, we got one for 50, but the moment we stick a decimal point and we add zeros, now we have four. So those two numbers are the same number, but they differ in magnitude, okay? The different accuracy, excuse me. Then uh, this one, all integers count, so obviously we got five, and then this one here, we got three, okay? Now, when we multiply and divide numbers, we look at sig figs. So if, for example, we were going to multiply these two numbers or divide them, our answer should have no more than two sig figs. Why? Because that number is the least accurate number. Okay? The same is true for if I were going to multiply or divide, and I emphasize multiply or divide only, okay? Because addition and subtraction, we use something else. We use decimal places, but it still deals with accuracy. So if we were gonna do that here to these two numbers, 
then our, our number, our final number should have no more than one sig fig in your answer, okay? And yes, I know you're, one could be tempted to get, you know, like I said, the calculator gives you an X number of, of numbers. It would be inaccurate to present all those digits because the numbers you use to do the calculations were not that accurate. Okay, I got a few more minutes. This is a summary about the, the zero and the sig figs, I'm mean, excuse me, and the uh, the decimal number and the integer to help you out if they're significant or not significant. Okay. All right. But to determine um, how many sig figs our, our number has, we have to uh, round a number. So like I said, you multiply a number, you get all these digits and you're like, okay, well, where do I truncate? Where do I cut it off? Well, we got to talk about rounding first, okay? The rule is very simple, okay? Is if we look at the number, okay, that we need to either gonna stay the same or we kick it up to the next value. For example, that number there, 5.4, okay? So we have 5.4 here. Now, that's the number we need to round. Either it stays at five or goes up. That's important. It will never go to four. It always going to either stay that value or go up to the next one. We look at the neighbor. Okay. We don't care if you have all these other numbers down the road there. That they don't, we don't care. Because I know one can say, why well, if I round this one up and then round this one up? No, we don't care about that. The immediate value of the neighbor, the first neighbor. And we use the rule, if that number is less than five, then we maintain the number that we're going to round at its value. So 5.4 is reported as five if we want one digit. If the neighbor is greater or equal to five, then we round that number up to the next value. So in this case, 5.5 gets rounded to six, okay? To six. We don't want to change the magnitude. Let me give you an example, okay? We have the, the, we have the question here that says, it gives you uh, 5,400, okay? And they're asking you to round it up to one sig fig. What to determine where the one sig fig is, you always start on the left and count in. Well, one sig fig is right here. Okay, so we got to look to see what we do with that five. We look at the neighbor, like we normally do for rounding. The neighbor's four, so that five remains at five. And so here's the important part. Numbers in front of where the decimal point will be get converted to zero. So look at the magnitude of where you're at. The number you begin with is in the 5,000 range, okay? And what I see sometimes the students do is they take the numbers and they chop them off the four and the zero, zero, they drop it off and, and they report five. Well, what have you done? You have changed the magnitude of that, okay? Think about it, put it, put it I always use money as an example. Put a dollar, the, the dollar symbol in front, right? You got $5,000. That's the range you're in. And if you drop those zeros, guess where you're at? You're at $5. What have you done? You changed the magnitude. What do you want, $5,000 or $5? I'll take the 5K. <laughs> All right? So that's how you check yourself to make sure. Put a dollar sign in front of it. So did I change the magnitude? Okay. And now, the other thing is, if there's any numbers after the decimal point, because we know that this, you know, five, four, zero, zero point, I don't know, two, three, okay, maybe that's the number you're starting off with, and we're being asked to truncate it again, okay? But like we just talked about, the numbers before the decimal point get converted to zero. The numbers after the decimal point, you're dropping off. And you still get 5,000 is your answer. Now, what if you mistakenly 
converted the two and three to zeros and report this. What have you done by reporting it as 5,000.00? How many sick figs does that number have compared to this number? Six. Six, exactly. Here you got one sick fig. And now by putting the decimal point back in and converting those, those zeros all count now. And so now you got one, two, three, four, five, six, six figs. So that would be incorrect, okay? So decimal numbers after decimal point, they go away. But numbers before the decimal point get changed to zero. Don't change the magnitude like we showed here. Okay, well, where am I? I'm at 18. Oh, not bad. Your one o'clock class stopped at 19. All right, let's, I got 531 for my clock here. Let me, uh, let's stop it off here and we'll continue.